excited today about our guest. Brett James is not only a multi-award winning hit songwriter, um, but he's an entrepreneur and he owns his own publishing company and is recently working on some a new venue and restaurant development. So um, would you give him a warm welcome? So let's let's start out with your pretty simple path to where you are today. Um, as I understand it, you started out in med school, you got a record deal, that didn't go anywhere, you went back to med school, and then you got all kinds of song papers about that time. Is that close? That's pretty close. Pretty, yeah. pretty straightforward path to uh, where I am now. Yeah, they all are, right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I didn't have it. I mean, I didn't. If I if I had to do over again uh, what I do now, I would go to Belmont and I would major in what you guys were majoring in. But um, that wasn't on my high school agenda plan. So um, my dad was a doctor, my grandfather was a doctor. I thought, well, I'll be a doctor. And so I went to Baylor in Texas undergrad, and then I went to back home. I'm from Oklahoma, the University of Oklahoma. Went to med school there. And uh, the summer after, anybody ever been to Canica, the little sports camp in Missouri? Anybody ever been there? Some of you guys probably have. Um, I took my, I worked there as a counselor right, between my freshman and sophomore years of med school and made a thousand bucks and took that thousand bucks and, uh, you know, to whatever studio was there in Oklahoma City and recorded the five, five of the first ten songs I'd ever written. I, I just decided, I went to a concert one night in Oklahoma City and thought, I watched the guy, Steve Warner was his name, it was probably some Steve Warner fans here. And I, I thought, you know, I think I could do that and maybe I should play around with this. So I started writing songs. And um, did a little really bad, you know, five song cassette demo there in Oklahoma City, where I'm from. And uh, sent it to my one, I had one huge contact in the music business. Uh, one of my best friends from college was an intern in uh, college radio promotion in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So that was my big connection. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I had this huge in, and I knew there was no way. That I, intern in Ann Arbor. Exactly. So I sent my little cassette to my intern friend, her name was Deb, she lives here now, and uh, Deb gave it to her boss, and her boss was not a big wig then, but had been in the past. She had run a, a big record label in New York called Atco Records and discovered in excess and some people like that. And uh, so one day I get a call from her boss, and she says, man, I really think this is good. And this was very like early 90s, I'm, I'm way old, so this is really early 90s, and it was like, I'm... I'm wearing a cowboy hat and you know wanting to be Garth Brooks. And uh, she says, uh, "Were you wearing scrubs at this point too?" No scrubs, no scrubs, which is a great song. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm in my Wranglers and my Ropers and my cowboy hat. And she says, uh, "When you know, I'd love to introduce you to some people in Nashville." I said, "Well, that's great, but I'm in medical school." And she said, "Well, when can you come to Nashville?" So I said, "Well, spring break." So spring break in my sophomore year in med school, I got my little Datsun, not a Nissan, it was a Datsun, before they were called Nissan. Uh, I had a really old crappy 180,000 yeah, mile Datsun Maxima, yep. and uh, it wasn't the same color that it had been originally, <laughs> and uh, drove to Nashville. And uh, she took me around a couple record labels, she patted me on the head and politely said, no thanks, you, you suck. And, um, <laughs> And the third record label she took me to, just, I don't know, we kind of lucked into a meeting. Actually, those were our only planned meetings, and all of a sudden, we luck into this meeting with a guy named Tim Dubois. And some of you guys probably know Tim. He's, I'm sure he's spoken here. Um, and Tim heard my stuff, and at the time, he was the president of Arista Records. And Arista Records was killing. Um, his first two acts were Alan Jackson and Brooks and Dunn, and at the time, they had six acts on the whole roster, all of which were, had sold at least 700,000 records on the last album, and they were just killing it. That was like the label you wanted to be on. And he looked at me across the desk my third day in Nashville and said, Mister, if you meet here, I'll give you a record deal. And I was like, I don't even know what to do with that at that time. I'm like, you know, what do you mean if I move to Nashville, you're going to get a record deal? So he gave me a cell number and said, if you decide to do it, call me, and uh, we'll do this. And uh, so I was obviously very encouraged, uh, but I was still a medical student. So I went back. Uh, finish that year of med school. Well, 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 I want to hear this conversation with your dad, who's a doctor. You know, uh, it was an easy conversation. Yeah. My dad, uh, who was a doctor, was also a frustrated singer. My mother was a classical pianist. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, my dad, by that time in his career, was kind of sick of being a doctor. And um, well, those were tough doctor times. They were tough doctor times. Care was coming hard. Absolutely. When I was in healthcare, the business had changed a lot since he <coughs> got in, in it initially. And he he kicked me out the door. He said, "Man, if you get a chance to do something like that, you should try." Kind of like if you never if you don't try it now, you regret it the rest of your life. Kind of deal. And so uh, I finished that year of school and took my medical board exam, my sophomore board exam. And so the next day, I got in the doctor and drove back to Nashville. And I thought I was just going to take a year off. Um, all that let you have in medical school is one year leave of absence. Um, so, you know, but I very naively thought that in a year you'd, you'd know whether you're going to be a star or not. You know, I'll figure you it had out. A record deal. I got, what well, could possibly go theoretically, I had, a, I had the offer of a record deal if I moved to town. That's what I had. Um, they always tell the truth. Anyway. Exactly. So, you know, I, I landed in Nashville and uh, and immediately knew I wasn't ready to have a record deal. Um, that was the first thing that, that, that was probably one of my wiser, I haven't made many wise choices in my life, but that was one of my wise choices that when I got here and started going around and seeing what kind of talent there was at Belmont and what kind of talent there was at local clubs and things like that, I was like, I know I'm not ready for this. Um, so I didn't call him for nine months after I moved to town. Um, I, I took a job waiting tables at Midtown Cafe and started playing all the open mic nights that I could and, and playing all the clubs and getting my music out in front of as many people as I could. And I was very lucky then as well that it only took me about three months to get a publishing deal. Um, and that was a big day that I got to you know, leave, the, leave the, the waiter, leave the restaurant and tell them that I, I was actually going to get paid to write songs. Um, but then six months after that, after I'd actually written some songs that I was proud of, done some actual real recording, then I went back and called Tim DuBois and said, hey man, I don't know if you remember me, it's been a year, but you told me a year ago if I moved to town you'd, you'd give me a record deal, what do you think? And he said, well come in, let's have a meeting. So we had a meeting, let's do a showcase. Um, I was the first artist that ever played the Wild Horse Saloon, a little piece of trivia, the, the week it opened. Um, I put a band together and played five days at the Wild Horse and made sure our act was together. And then the, the next, the sixth day, I think, we invited the record label out and I did get a record deal. Um, and then proceeded to be a fiddle artist for the next seven years. And, um, and, and that's an interesting thing because, uh, yeah, this is a really long story how boring you guys no, is no, tell no, me. No. Um, I, uh, you get your record deal and everybody, and literally I, I got the record deal everybody wanted. I mean, there was not a person in Nashville that didn't want that deal, and I beat out a hundred other guys for the slot, you know, it's like, wow, this is pretty heavy stuff. And all of a sudden I'm walking around and people are treating me like I'm already Garth Brooks. I'm getting just, Everybody you know, wants to write with you. Everyone, I'm getting to write with everybody that's ever written a, a smash, and you know, I'm getting treated really well, like, man, I must be good. And all of a sudden you kind of looking in the mirror going, wow, this is pretty cool. And, uh, you know, get a publishing deal, and now you're getting paid to make music, and this is great, and this is awesome. And then your first single comes out, and it's stiff. And then your second single comes out, and it's stiff. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're three or four years into the process, and you're like, uh-oh, maybe I'm not Garth Brooks after all. What do I do now? Well, you know, fortunately, they, they kept me on the level for two or three more years, and you regroup like you do. You change producers, you change direction, whatever you do, you're trying to make it work. So long story short, of seven years after getting that record deal, um, I lost my record deal, and I lost my publishing deal. And at that time, this was in the 90s, my publishing deal was pretty big. I was like, living fat, and this is great, blah, blah, blah. Um, and in the meantime, I've had two kids. And so now I've got a wife and two kids, and I've been in town for seven years, and I've lost my record deal, and i got a publishing deal that's worth a third of what my, my last one was. And I'm like, this is not good. I'm not going the right way in this music business. I need to figure this out. Um, it was also the late 90s, and um, you know, country music especially does this. You know, right now country music is, is screaming. There'll be a time where pop music sort of makes a comeback, or rock kind of comes back, where country does this. It's just it's a natural ebb and flow of people's listening taste. Um, and the, the early 90s were the greatest boom we'll ever see in country music. Um, and the late 90s, it just knows that. And so not only was did I lose my you know, my publishing deal got cut by a lot, but, you know, I think our professional writing staff in Nashville from 1995 to the year 2000 probably went from about 1,200 signed writers to something like 250. So there were lots of people out of jobs in our business. And 
you know, I've been in town long enough to see some friends grow old in this business and drag the family that, that probably didn't have enough talent to make it. And uh, what happens a lot of times is they drag their family through it for 20 or 30 years and all of a sudden their wife leaves them, their kids are bitter because dad never did anything with his life and he just, he never supported the family and he's still looking for that one big hit. And I didn't want to be that guy, to be honest with you. And it got to the point where I was embarrassed to walk into my publishing company because I've been in town for so long and things weren't going well and I'm just like, I gotta make a change. So uh, after being in town for seven years, uh, true story is I had a panic attack in Target on White Ridge Road one day, the only panic attack I've ever had. I wanted to buy my kid this $10 pair of shoes and I was like, man, I'd really like to buy my kid that $10 pair of shoes but I can't afford it. And that's uncool and I'm not living like this. And so I, I wrote a letter to the dean of the medical school and said, I know I've been gone for seven years, is there any way I can get back in? And uh, she wrote me back and said, we don't normally do this. You're only supposed to get one year off, but if you're willing to repeat the year that you know, repeat a year to get back up to speed, we'll take you right back. And so, um, in 1999, after being here for seven years, I, uh, I I didn't tell my wife I wrote that letter, and I came, kind of came home one day and said, I'm going back to medical school in Oklahoma, and uh, that's what we got to do. And she was cool. Um, so I went back to med school on September 1st. And uh, of 1999, I'd started kind of writing. I had one writing partner here who's still, I share office <coughs> buildings with well, I'm building, but he's one of my best friends in the world, like Troy Burgess. And uh, Troy was, Troy had been our intern at my publishing company, but he was a great songwriter. And we started writing this cool stuff. And I told Troy one day, I said, Look, I'm going back to med school. Um, sorry, I know we're writing cool stuff, but I'm going to be living in Oklahoma. And he said, No problem, man, I'll just come to Oklahoma. <laughs> and so, Troy, uh, a week a month, would fly from Nashville to Oklahoma, and I'd go to pathology or whatever I had that day, and I'd come home and one or after labs or whatever, and we'd write songs until one or two in the morning. We'd write seven or eight songs a week. And I sort of had that kind of, I'd been in town for seven years, and I was a little bit like, screw it, I'm not going to try to write. I got a job, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to write what I think is cool now, and instead of trying to fit into that box. and. Um, you know, I started school on September 1st. Faith Hill cut one of our songs on September 4th. It ended up on her Breathe album. It's the late main copies. And then, for whatever reason, while I was in med school for the next nine months, I got 33 of my songs recorded and had five top 10 records that, that year. And I'm, you know, my, my, my publisher's calling me, and I'm, I'm in the library at med school. She's going, you're not going to believe this, but Tim McGraw just cut your song, and it's his first single, or, you know, whatever. And it was, so it was pretty cool. And, um, after that year and all those cuts and five top ten records, I had to look in the mirror again and go, well, now I got a job back in Nashville, so I quit med school for the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, oh, by the way, I also I got... Bet, I bet the dean didn't quite have the same reaction your dad did. You know what? Like, she it was funny, man. Um, it was pretty crazy. I, uh, my meeting with her went like this. Uh, I, was, I was scared to death because she had pulled all kinds of strings to get me back into school. And all of a sudden, I had all the success that she didn't know about. And I was scared of that. So what I did is I literally, on a piece of paper, I wrote down all the artists and the songs that they'd cut of mine while I'd been in school that year. It was, it was a pretty, you know, great list. You're talking Kenny Chesney and Tim McGraw and, you know, all these cool, cool people. And uh, thank God I had no idea she was a country fan. <laughs> so I walked into her office and I said, look, here's what's happened in the last nine months to my, like, music career. And I was kind of like, what do you think? She's like, she looked at it, she goes, oh, my gosh, you've got to go. You've got to. They, those are awesome songs. I love that song. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, is, this is a nerdy med school. So it's kind of a yes, but she turned and she looked at me and she goes, but you're never coming back. She goes, I'm going to make sure good and we're done. <laughs> so I'm a two time med school dropout. And uh, I, failed to mention, I failed to mention I got offered another record deal while I was in med school from Arista, again, under a new regime run by Joe Galante. Um, did another record for them the next year in 2000. My single stiffed and, and I failed twice as an artist and failed twice as a kind of med student. So. Okay. The songwriting thing seems to be working out. Songwriting thing has been fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So you've now taken that and, and really started to, to diversify who you are and what you are as a business owner. Basically. Talk about kind of the steps you've taken along the way. You started to have some success and kind of walk us through each of the, the progressions of, of how you got into each of the new ventures that you've done and, and sure, walk us sure. through that. Well, I think, I mean, I think for me, uh, 
everything about the music business is entrepreneurial. I mean, there, there is no, there is no, you get a job in one of the, the, the big three, you know, music firms hires you and they put you in, you know, you go to work 60 hours a week. That just doesn't exist. Um, I think what we all have to do is figure out what we're good at and figure out how to apply that and figure out, you know, something that we do as good or better than anybody else and put ourselves in, in and find a way to get that, make that happen. Um, and you and guys it's often are, a surprise. And it's often a surprise. And you guys are growing up in a very different time. You guys are going to college in a very, very different time than I was. I mean, it was more like that, honestly. It was more like the big guys ran the music business and you were just trying to knock on their door and, and somehow bust through. Obviously, it's all entrepreneurial now. I mean, there's still some major record labels, but as you guys know, you guys have, I'm sure everybody in this room has a Facebook presence, a Twitter presence. Everybody in this room is, is you know, out there, you know, kind of being entrepreneurial today, online, probably. But we didn't have those you know, resources, we didn't know how to do that, so we kind of had to knock on the doors and, and just ask the big man for a record deal or a publishing deal or whatever that looked like. Um, for me, it, it just... You know, you kind of also have to take what's put on your plate. Right. You know, um, I, I started just having insane amounts of success at the start of like 2000, 2001, 2002. That little run, um, you know, I was just, you know, I was just cut up. You know, it was, it was stupid. I was getting 35, 40 cuts a year and having, you know, hits all over the place. And and so all of a sudden, I kind of woke up. If you wake up and you go, "Wow, I'm I'm a hit songwriter. I got to figure out, you know, what do I do next? And how do I keep this going? I mean, that's the challenge now. Now, you know, now now I look in the mirror and everybody goes, "Man, he's the old guy. He's had lots of hits. So how do you reinvent and become the young new hit guy again? You know, that's part of the problem. Right. You don't want to be the guy whose songs get sung out at the Grand Ole Opry. No. Yeah. You never want to. Be, you don't want to be that guy yet. Yeah. Anyway. Right. You know. Okay. And, exactly. So, you know, it's all about taking what's given you. I mean, you. You know, and, and having as many skills as you can. Um, so what was the first big, different kind of opportunity besides just writing songs and content? Well, for me, production. I mean, you know, I don't produce a lot. I, um, the only act I produce officially right now is Kip Moore. Anybody ever Kip Moore? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, he's the only act I produce right now. Um, but he also writes my publishing company. Um, the reason, I mean, straight up, the reason I don't produce more records in, in country music is because there's not much money in producing country records, to be flat honest with you. There used to be lots. Um, back when you could produce an album and it sold 10 million copies, that was different than you produce an album and it sold 600,000 copies. It was great. Um, so those those numbers have gone down so drastically that for me to want to produce a record, I either want to write a majority of the songs on them or I want to publish the majority of the songs on them. So that's a bit of an entrepreneurial way to look at that. Is that you know how how best do I? What's you know it's all time management. Where does my time go? And if I'm going to spend six weeks making a record on you and I'm gonna get paid a, a fee, you know, and you know, obviously some points on the backside, but we're really only gonna sell 40,000 records, we're gonna sell 140,000 records. That back end fee's not much. And those six weeks of my time could have probably been you know, better spent writing more songs or doing whatever. So I have to kind of manage my time. But the first thing that came to me outside of songwriting was production. And I, I did a few records. Um, and enjoy the process, I love producing. Um, I love the creative part. I love parts of producing. The parts of it are just tedium, as you guys know, that spend time in the studio. But um, the other parts of the studio that are, you know, are can be just spectacular and lots of fun. And if you're working with the right artist, it's it can be magical. So I love that process. And like I said, if there were better money in that, I'd do a lot more of it. But there's just not. You think to do more of that later in your career when money might not be as big of, a, of an issue? Um, I don't know. Which I, that ever happens? I doubt it. You know, I doubt it. I, I love writing songs. I mean, I, I mean, the thing that I'm best at, I know that I, you know, I love to produce, but I mean, the thing that I'm best at is getting in a room and making something up, you know. And the further I get away from that, the further I realize that I need to be doing that more, Back you know. Um, and so now it's, now, I mean, production was the first thing that I got into outside of just straight up waking up every morning and writing songs. Um, the other ways I'm on entrepreneurial is I did start a publishing company five, six years ago. Um, Kip Moore was the first guy signed. It's small. It's a co-venture with Warren Chapel. We have six writers and two employees. Um, and that is, for me, it's an, an amazing blessing and a little bit of a curse. Um, uh, the amazing blessing of it is that all the writers that I sign, I get to write sign by one. And everybody that I sign, I think are insanely talented. 
and I, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm lucky to get to write songs with these people and to, and to get to work with them. And I'm lucky to get to publish them, and I'm lucky to get to be around them. And it's really fun to get to mentor them. I mean, that's a little bit of a cool thing because not that I'm some genius or some, but I've just been around longer, so I've you know seen the pitfalls and seen a couple of things that you can do better and a couple of things you can do worse. And it's nice to have that kind of familial relationship with these with these people. Right. Um, the downside for me, for me, and I didn't expect this going in, is um, I feel very incredibly personally responsible for all, all six of their careers and my two employees. That's the and, tough part about and, being an entrepreneur with employees. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that yeah, weighs on me pretty heavily. You know, if Eric Dillon doesn't get the cut that I thought he was going to get and he's been waiting to get for the last four months, it crushes me. You know, and it, or if Justin Weaver's career is not going as I think it should be going, that keeps me up at night. And so there are elements to that that are really awesome and elements of that that are, are, are you know, they weigh on me pretty heavily. And they sort of take my off the ball of doing what I do best, which is wake up in the morning and sit down with the guitar and write something. Because there's a lot of stuff in your head and you've got miles to be to worry about. Absolutely, yeah. sure. So just to add a little more serious nights, <laughs> now you've gotten into a venue deal. The venue is not really a venue deal, it's a real estate deal. And that, that's been, um, you know, that I bought a building downtown. I bought an old, uh, anybody remember, you know where the Rutledge is? Mm -hmm. um, they're building all kinds of hotels down there in the new convention center. There's an old church next door to the Rutledge. It's a 13,000 square foot church. And it looks like, a, looks like a mini Ryman auditorium. And it was the first uh, free black church built in Tennessee. It was built in 1874. And honestly, the way that happened is, is um, I had some ideas for a venue, for a space, for probably a I would like to kind of, would never, don't ever want to step on the Bluebird's toes because the Bluebird will always be the mother church of songwriting, but the Bluebird, is, and I play it constantly, and I'm on NSAI and NS, the board of NSAI, we own it, so I'm a huge supporter of the Bluebird, but it's in a strip mall, it seats 100 people, and it's downtown, and we're about to have 350,000 conventioners come through downtown. Who've been watching Nashville every week on television and say, oh, I like it. <laughs> so, on a, kind of my concept was to find something for songwriters that's as iconic for songwriters as the rhyme is for, for country music. Right. Um, I stumbled upon this church and, uh, and you know, I bought it, as, more as a real estate investment than anything else. And so now I'm trying to figure out ways to still be a, a, a you know, make money off it as a real estate investment, but I really would like to, to see it become something incredibly cool. So, so how active are you in the development? Uh, I'd like to be very active, but right now I'm just looking for the right partners, and I'm meeting with all kinds of people. So right now it's very much in the planning and development stages. I don't want to rush it. Um, you know, I could I could just put for lease signs on it tomorrow and, and lease it out pretty easily, but I don't want to rush it because I'd like it to be something, you know, great for Nashville um, over the long period. Patience is good. Yeah, patience is really good. So I'm trying to figure that figure that out. Um, talk a little bit about, you pointed out that these guys are in a little bit of a career stage than you are. Um, what are three or four nuggets that you would throw at them in terms of what they need to be doing for the next five or ten years to kind of get their careers headed in the right direction? Or the next five months for that? Well, who, like, uh, who, who in this room is going into music business, straight up? Not nothing, not going to be on the, on the creation of music side. So we got... You, how many people are going to be on the music creation side? Songwriting, artists, musicians. So majority are going to be on the creative side of this room. Um, the first, the first, I mean, the first thing I could ever tell anybody, especially if it's going to be on the creative side, have fun, man. I and mean, this is not, we're not like, you know, we're not dealing, you know, I went to medical school. People aren't dying because you didn't write the right song today. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, this is not, you know, this is not life or death kind of stuff. This right. is, this is supposed to be. You're supposed to be doing this because you love it. And if you can kind of remember that forever, period. That's it. I do this because I love it. Whether or not you ever do it for a living, or whether or not you're ever, you know, the next big star, you've won. You're already way ahead of the game. And I mean that's that's kind of the first rule, and I forget that rule about every other day. How do you get that back? Um, it's challenging. I think I think we all run into that, no matter what the career 
It's challenging. Um, you, know, what you're doing. you know what I've what I've learned. Uh, you know, I've, I've probably written. I know I've written over two thousand songs. Um, you know, and so that's a lot of rooms. It's a lot of days in rooms. You know, writing with artist X Y Z, writing with you know whoever. Um, you know, I've been lucky enough to be songwriter of the year a couple of times. I've been lucky enough to kind of have, you know, all that. And what, what kind of, what keeps me up at night is when I don't feel like I'm the hottest writer in town now. And so there's, there's this weird competition that comes in because of me and my peers. Like, I can tell you the writers that are killing it right now in Nashville. And this year, I'm not one of them, you know. And it's kind of been, this has been a, like my first year in a long time not to have just like killed it. And I'm like, holy crap, I want, I want that back. Right. And so now I'm sort of on, on like this kind of weird business place where I want to like just win. And that's kind of taking the love out of it, to right. be honest with you. Right. Um, you have to remember. It goes back where you were when you were trying too hard to write. A little bit, <coughs> yeah, you want to try to force it a little bit. Um, and you know, I mean, some part of it's my, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to get to, to go write other genres and music. I'm blessed to get to go to LA and London and take that, you know, and do all kinds of stuff like that and take my eye off the ball of Nashville. And some of that's just a natural progression. But, you know, uh, there, there is an element to where you, success makes you want more success and, and almost be hungrier for it for, for not for financial reasons and really not for creative reasons, just almost if you're a little bit type A like I am, for competitive reasons, you sort of want to win. And that's kind of unhealthy. And that's something that I have to fight on a daily basis to remember that, you know, um, the thing that I like doing the most, the thing that I literally get the greatest buzz out of in life is sitting in a room with some of my best friends that I've, some of them have had for 20 years now. And, and, and some of them are, and you know, all of them have had hits, but all of them I knew when I was 22, or most, a lot of them I knew when I was 22 and 25 and 26, and making something up and hoping somebody cares about it. You know, that's, that's the great joy of it. And, and I really have come to that kind of place in life. And I enjoy a lot. I have a million different hobbies. I'm a, you know, I love, I'm a crazy sports freak. And I'm a crazy this freak and crazy whatever. But ultimately, there are moments in my week when I look at my, when I sit in a room and I'm like with two, one or two insanely talented people. And I just have that, still that flash of like, what in the world am I doing here? You know, and, and if I can kind of well, keep my... Go back in that Target store again try to buy that toy. Yeah, yeah, well, it's not even that, but just what am I doing? How did I get this lucky? I mean, those are the, that's what I mean by that. You know, how did I get this lucky that I'm sitting here right now? Right. And Is that what you get the joy back when that happens? Absolutely. Do you have anybody uh, who kind of externally gives you a little kick to get you in the right direction? Not really. Not really. I wish I had. I wish I had somebody. You know, it's 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 the other thing is weird about doing it for a while and kind of becoming the boss as opposed to the the new writer is that there's there's sort of um, there's nobody kind of watching me every day going do this do that do this do that. Right. Um, but the good news is you hire people that are really on your team. You know, um, the guy that runs my publishing, Nate Lauer, for instance. Um, you know, we, have, we were having this conversation about just kind of recalibrating, you know, and you always have to do that. I mean, that's constant recalibration. But, you know, he's like, so he, you know, calls me yesterday afternoon, can I come to the house tonight? And we spent four hours in my studio at the house last night just talking about songs, talking about ways that we need to, you know, what can we do to make this better? What can we do to make this different? And so you don't have, then the hard part about it, you know, like being the boss is that you don't have the guy going, do that, do that. Right. But, but hopefully you have team members alongside you that care enough about you, like Nate does, that, you know, I know he's, I know he's busting his butt today at the office. <laughs> I found being an entrepreneur in a totally different industry, it was really important for me to have some people on the outside, almost like accountability of people who would, if I got a little bit too big for my bridges, would kind of set me in line. Absolutely. <clears throat> Well, the music business will set you in line any, any day. Well, sure. <laughs> you too big for the bridges. It'll, yeah. it'll, it'll kick you around pretty good. Also, just to kind of be an accountability cop for me once. Sure. I think, I think it's really good. important. So, fun. All right, let's do number one. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, <laughs> Word your tails off. You know, um, you know, my dad gave me, you know, my dad never wrote a song in his life, but, you know, 
you know, some of the best advice I ever, he ever, you know, told me when I first came to town is just remember every day you don't write a song, there's a lot of other people that are. And that's pretty good advice. You know, there are, uh, it's, as you guys know, I mean, songwriting, the art, the, the, the music business um, is insanely competitive. There are just so many <coughs> wonderfully talented human beings that God has made on this earth. And, and so, you know, I think that if you have that level of talent and then are willing to, you know, put in the sweat, that's where, that's where it pays off. You know, so, I mean, work, 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 you know. Have fun while you're working because probably if you're going to be successful in the music business, you're going to do a lot of working. So if you enjoy it, then it's all good. You know, that's the other line that everybody knows that, you know, if you, if you get to do something you enjoy for a living, you never have to work a day in your life. And that's pretty true. You know. So I might talk a lot with not only the music business entrepreneurs we work with, but just in general is, um, they don't know this, but they're a little bit more impatient generation than some of them. Sure. And yeah, you do know that, don't you? <coughs> and uh, and and they can't help it. It's my generation that raised them that way, so it's my fault. <laughs> and and that's tough in a business like this is is being impatient. And uh, I mean, I mean, look at you. I mean, it just it just like happened like that. It's just over and over. Yeah. I mean. I, um, how would you guide young people who, as a generation, is a little less patient? How do you have to, what can, advice can you give to help calibrate that? Um, I do, th I mean, I think patience is huge. Uh, you know, you guys are all, I mean, the, those of you who are on the creative side are all artists. And sometimes you don't find it until you're, you find it, and, and you don't know you didn't have it found until you find it, and you go, wow, I didn't have it then, but I thought I did, and now I found it, and everybody else says, wow, now you found it, and then you kind of really know you found it. Um, <laughs> but that's kind of it, you know, I mean, everybody thinks they, you know, you know, when you're doing it, you think you're on it, and sometimes you are, but sometimes you're not, and sometimes, you just have to be patient with the process of being an artist. Um, and realize that that music is like any other art form. The more you do it, typically the better you get. You know, um, that's not always true. You know, um, Paul McCartney's not writing as good songs as he did 40 years ago. So there is some magic dust in there that you can say, well, there was a time when, for whatever reason, the creative skies opened up and fell down on McCartney and Lennon for those seven years and. You know, McCarty continued it with Wings for a little while, but you know, he's not writing yesterday right now. And Billy Joel's not writing the kinds of songs he used to write. And Paul Simon's not writing the kinds of songs he used to write. Right? And so you can look at, I mean, yes, there is a creative window. And so the other thing is when you find that place where you are, when it's just money, that's when you want to keep working and working and working. And, and songwriting, if you do it over a long period of time like I do, you kind of feel it. You kind of know when you're, when you walk in a room and it just flies out of you and you know it's great and you're confident about it. Or there are other times when you walk into a room and you just, you're fighting every word and nothing, everything sucks and why am I even doing this? And you know, there's those days too. So, you know, my best example of that, I'll give you a great example. And, and this is something that as an older guy in the business, I've learned a lot from Kip Moore. And he's kind of my little brother now because we've been through a lot of wars together. But I signed Kip Moore um, those of you guys don't know who he is, he's, he's doing great. He's about to have his third number one single. He's, you know, his first single did two million. His second single did two million. He's doing great. Um, but he, uh, he wrote for me for about two and a half. When he walked in my office, he sat down, and he'd been, it was, I'd seen him at the Y for six months. And just, being, you know, incredibly cool. He'd come up and go, hey, man, you know, I know you're busy, but if you ever got a man, I'd love to kind of play you some stuff. And it was one of those deals where I, uh, he was a super nice guy, so I meant to, but I just didn't have time. And so six months go by to the point where I'm like, I don't want to walk in the wide because I'm going to see that kid guy, and I'm going to have to apologize again for not being able to get together. So finally, he goes and meets with a buddy of mine who's head of a and at Universal, Joe Fisher. And Joe Fisher called me one day. He goes, this guy walked into my office. His name's Kip Moore. He says he knows you. He's good. You should meet with him. I said, send him over now. So he comes over to my office. He plays me two songs, and I knew it was a star. The songs were okay, 
But all of a sudden, I mean, that's a whole other tangent I could go off on. But after being around a long time, stars are stars are stars are stars. Star. You know when you see them. And, and like surgeon in med school. Sort of like you just know. Yeah. You just know. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and, and the second song we played, I said, okay, you got a publishing deal. What else can we do? You know, you're a star. I mean, I didn't tell him that, but I'm thinking this guy's a star. <laughs> so for those of you who are worried about patience, two and a half years go by. We, you know, we immediately, I thought he was ready, he thought he was ready. We immediately went out and did a showcase for all the labels and everybody kind of thought it sucked. You know, wasn't good. I don't know, I was on stage, I thought it was great. We get just very mediocre feedback. And I'm like, okay, well, we're not on it yet. So we kind of do regroup. So literally, two and a half years go by from the day I signed him. And about two and a half years in, for Kip, it was very much a could have gone either way kind of thing. He wasn't writing, he was writing a lot, but he wasn't writing a great song. Um, he really wasn't that great a musician. He was a good singer. Um, his guitar playing was horrific. I remember he used to like sit in our office and you know, he was he was trying to get better. So he'd YouTube things and he'd be sitting in my office and he practically lived there. And I remember walking into my sister one day going, he doesn't even need to be trying, man. This guy's, you know, either you got it or you don't. He had no right hand, he had no left hand. I'm like, this so, guy's... Sounds like my guitar player. Yeah, he just... Yeah. So I only do it in my living room for my dog. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm just like, this guy... <laughs> and they don't like it. And they don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking, this guy's just, you know, forget that. You just always going to have to take... You can be a singer, but you always going to have a guitar player. Right? Well, Kip, the other thing about him is he was a two-sport college athlete. He played college golf and he played uh, college basketball. And he's a great golfer, going to be a pro golfer at one point. But he understands that mentality of, okay, if I go to the driving range and I work on my grip and I work on my floor and I work on my backswing and I work on this, then I will, and I hit 8 million golf balls, I'll get better at golf. And that was sort of his mentality, which never has been my mentality in music. Everything is, for me, it's always been just, I can sing, I pick up a guitar, I can kind of play. You know, I'm, not, I'm no great, I'm, not, I'm certainly not a great player because I've never practiced, but I'm good enough, you know what I'm saying? It's like... For me, it was all, I just thought it was all kind of, well, this is kind of music's kind of natural talent. Right. All of a sudden, he realized he was in a little bit of trouble, and he, he set his mind to learning guitar, and he started reading and studying every great songwriter there ever was. He bought every book by every great lyricist on earth, and read them front to back and front to back and front to back, and started studying why songs are great and why songs are not great. And literally a, a, a switch went off in, in his head. And this is about three years ago. And um, I will honestly tell you, and I've written with almost everybody, I've never been in a room with a better songwriter than okay. He is, I think he's Springsteen. I think he's like gonna have a 35 year career as, as a, an icon. He's that good. And like I know the songs that are on his fifth album and we're starting his second album next month. It's, it's, it's that kind of creative, like all of a sudden, boom. And he hasn't written a song that I didn't think, that didn't blow my head off in three years. So there's something to be said for our work and digging in and figuring it out. So one last question and we'll open it up. Um, you said you have two kids. Four. Yeah. Four two then, yeah. Mm. Two cents. Four kids. Uh, med school or music business? Music business, when will fun. <laughs> cool. All right. Questions? Do you only have country writers and have you thought about branching out to other genres? Um I let's think. I have but I write I love to write in other genres. Um, I'm gonna be at the ASCAP Pop Awards. I get an award for a song from Mr. Know It All this week um, in LA. Um, and so I love to write. I love to talk more. I mean, I, I mean, when I, when, you know, it's a great of a process, but, um, you know, I'll be out next week if, working in LA all week, and I won't work with anybody over 25, and I won't pick up a guitar, I won't even bring one to a session. Um, you know, it's a very different process. Um, I have, uh, three of my writers are, are amazing country writers, but they also do tracks, and they also can write other things. But I'm always looking, especially right now, I'm really looking for great track guys. So if any, are there any really great track guys in the room, call Cornman Music, please. We're, I mean, I think we're, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit desperate because 
What's interesting about LA is that LA has 2,000 amazing track guys and no you great talent. Uh, that's fine. I'm fine with that. To, you know, LA has 2,000 amazing track guys and almost and and there's a, a super shortage of great top one. It's great. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about when I say top one, right? Mm -hmm. Am I familiar with that term? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, top. If you're if you're writing a song in Los Angeles, it's usually you're either writing just to a track. The track guy might not even be there, but typically you just walk in. You might buzz through eight or ten tracks, and that one's great. So we write the melody and the lyric on top of the track, so it's called top line. And that's pretty much the way all pop songs get written these days, if it's a Rihanna or it's a Bruno Mars or something like that. Um, and which is very different than the traditional natural way, which we sit down with guitars and or piano or whatever and just write something. Question back up in the back. Other questions? Um, the, new, the new venue, uh, when is that going to be open? I have no idea. It's <laughs> such a developmental thing. That's pretty exciting. Though. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. I mean, there's a lot of market for songwriters in this town. With Bluebird, what they've done with Vanderbilt. And, sure. Uh, it sells out every year. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot of... It's a cool thing. Yeah, it is a cool thing. Uh, when you went to med school for the second time, um, had your buddy not agreed to fly out to Oklahoma you know, that's a great question. Um, and the, the, the answer is, for me, is I pretty much had given up. I mean, um, but, you know, I, I knew, you know, there's that thing that nobody can take away your ability to write a song. Nobody can take away your love of writing a song. Whether or not anybody cares, doesn't matter, you know. And for me, it was like, you know, the reason, <coughs> honestly, the reason I kept writing a lot that year is because I had just signed a new publishing deal, and with my new publisher, six weeks in, I was his only writer. Mark Bright, he's probably spoken to you guys. I mean, it's Carrie Underwood's producer, among other things, but Mark, I was his only writer. And, you know, I, I was like, so I sat him down to breakfast, and I said, look, I know I'm your only writer. I know you're just starting this company. But I'm going back to Oklahoma in med school. Is that cool? You know, and it was a bit of a shock to him. And he was completely cool about it. He understood the need to feed your family. And he said, yeah, man, you've got a year in your contract. Let's see what happens. So if I hadn't had that publishing deal, I might have just quit altogether. But it, it was kind of a, what, the way it worked out was it was very freeing for me. Um, you know, um, I literally said, screw it. I can write what I want. And I'm going to write songs that I think are cool. And if nobody else cares, I got a job. I'm going to be a doctor someday. So screw Nashville, screw the whole deal. I'm just going to write songs I like. And sometimes, and you hear that story over and over again, a lot of times when people say that, that's when the success comes. Yeah. Have you ever felt burnt out, like, during a songwriting process or session, and just kind of like, wow, this is like the sixth song written today or whatever, and you just kind of put it away, and you keep going? Uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know if it's the, the type A guy in me or whatever, but um, I can't remember a session that I didn't finish a song. Um, I mean, I'm going I'm to I'm write it in a day, usually write it in three or four hours kind of guy, and I almost never look back. Um, that said, there are lots of those songs <laughs> where I'm in there and, you know, it's one thing if you're writing with writers, it's another thing if you're writing with an artist. And if the artist is no good and you're writing for that artist and they're not going to be any good and it's just going to be what it is that day, Sometimes you just finish the song to get the heck out of the room. <laughs> so I've done, I will admit to doing that sometimes, yes. And those are like, we won't ask you with who. No, we don't ask me with who, but a lot of, so there are those days you're just like, oh my gosh, I've got to get out of here, you know. But usually it's like, throw out a bunch of crap until the song's done, put it on tape, and get the heck out of there, you know. So that's, for me, that's the version of sort of burned out in the room. I never get burned out on writing songs because it's always tomorrow, it's always fun, you know, and I can always mix it up. I don't have to write and go try to write a Kenny Chesney song. Well, that's what I like about what I do. Um, I, I feel very lucky. I'm one of the kind of few that, that does get to sort of do some cross-genre stuff in Nashville, you know. Um, and I get to write with Daughtry and Bon Jovi on the rock side. I get to write with, you know, the, the pop, you know, the Esther Deans of the world and the, you know, the Will I Am's of the world on the pop side. So I'm, I'm really blessed to get to kind of like Mix it up a little bit. That's fun for me. Do you have a consistent creative writing process, or does it change with the people that you write? 
What was the first thing? Just said like, are there things you do when you go into a songwriting session or when you write a song to like determine what you want to or does it change with the different people that you write with? It, it absolutely changes with the people you write with on some level. But what I do, uh, what I do like to keep, uh, if you if you are, the first thing I like to keep is the title list, and I think it's I almost think that's a must for every songwriter. You know, um, if if something hits you while you're walking out of this building that you know somebody says something kind of crazy, and it's three words you haven't heard together before, but it sounds like it could be a title of a song, even if it's a line from a song. Put it in your phone, man. Put it on, the, you know. Put it somewhere, so you didn't, you didn't lose that. And almost the first thing I do when I sit down to write, we're gonna sit down to write a song this afternoon, you know, especially if it's a country song. I'm, I mean, even if we're starting from a groove, the first thing I hit on my computer is I bring up my title list, just so I'm staring at a bunch of thoughts, ideas. They might even be just cool words, you know. Man, that's a word I've been wanting to put in the song for a while. Because sometimes they can just stimulate something. Or sometimes you hit a groove. And you hear where the, the hook or the, the you know you hear where the hook should land in that groove. This is going to be cool. What does that say? And then you look at your page, and there it is, and it works. And you're like, now we're on it, you know. So I think starts are the most important. I mean, that's usually obviously as you guys know who are writers. I mean, that's sort of the hardest thing, right? Is 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 where you're going to start. And it's also as as you as you write more, uh, for me anyway, it becomes I'm a lot more picky about where I start. Because um, all of us in the room can sit down. I mean, I'm, I'm just betting because you're Beaumont students, and I know you're probably all brilliant, probably way more brilliant than I am. But all of us can sit down and write a good song this afternoon. All of us can. But good songs don't get very far. Um, you know, I mean, great songs sometimes don't even get very far. I mean, stupendous songs get there. You know what I'm saying? And and usually your starting point is going to define define your ending point every time. So if we start with an idea that's good, we'll write a good song. If we start with an idea that's unbelievable, then we'll probably write an unbelievable song. And so the, the older and the more I write, the pickier I get about what I want to start on. And sometimes it's worth taking the extra 30 minutes or an hour. You know, yeah, that's pretty cool. Let's save that. And let's try some other things. And maybe we'll come back to that. But let's throw down some other ideas first. We are out of time. Thank Sorry, you very much. Talk to you guys all. Thank you.